Well, good to see you all here. Um, I get to talk about our data-oriented technology stack. A gentleman here heard about it. And when, uh, when he heard about it, he probably heard us talk about performance. Performance, 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 and performance by default in particular. The reason we talk about that so much is because we focus on it because it's the one part of a game engine that you cannot add back later on. However, what about convenience? Let's talk about some programmer convenience. If you're a programmer that wants to use dots today, you kind of start like this. You make a component. But to use it in the editor, you have to make this authoring component. To make it do something, you need to make a system. To make it do that fast, you need to make a job. And then to run the job, you need to schedule that job. So you could say, well, I don't know, Lucas, that sounds like a lot of work to move something around. And you'd be kind of right. Because there's only a few lines in this page of code that actually have some programmer intent. So the next release of Dots tries to help with this. We'll start with this authoring component at the top. Instead of us asking you to write it, you can ask the compiler to write it by just adding this generate authoring component attribute. Here in the bottom with the struct, let's remove that for a second and let's replace it with the entities.foreach statement. I'll get to that in a second, but if you compare this to what we started with, that's already a substantial improvement in terms of the amount of boilerplate that you need to deal with. Now, let's take a look at this new code. The programmers in the room, they might have had a little heart attack because there's a lambda expression in here. <laughs> and those cause GC allocations, and those cause GC spikes, and those cause complaining customers. In the next dots release, we're making the lambda expression in the entities that for each, we're making it special. Instead of running it as normal C sharp, we convert it into that same job struct that we were asking you to write manually before. So when you use this construct, you're using the Unity job system to go wide over all your cores. However, it also uses burst. If you look at the burst inspector for this code, you can see that the inner loop uses these XMM1, XMM2 registers. These are SIMD instructions that operate on multiple elements at the same time. So not only are you going wide over all your cores, on each of those cores, you're going wide using all the SIMD lanes. And that's a great place for us to be in, when you can have the most optimal code you could write, but where you can write it in a relatively humane way that doesn't come at the expense of that performance. Another great convenient thing for pro programmers in Dots is that when we ship Dots, we ship it to you as C-sharp source packages. If you've played around with Dots, that means that the complete source code of Dots and all the features that are built on top of it are on your laptop, in your backpack, under your chair right now. If you make a Dots game and you grab a debugger and you start single-stepping through your game code, you'll step through your game code into our Dots code into the physics code, into the net code, into the animation engine. You can see everything, you can change everything, you can make fun of my incredibly verbose local variable names. <laughs> Many people do that. I won't give up, though. <laughs> because in Dots, there's no more black boxes. You can see everything. All right, enough with these programmers. Let's get Joachim and Martin on stage. Thank you, Lucas. Now, Lucas talked about how to write code for dots. But you also need a great tool to create your content. And for dots, we're going to use the exact same Unity editor you know and love already. So Martin, let's take a look at some content. Yeah, so let's jump into our prototyping level here. It's built exactly like you would expect in Unity. It's made out of prefabs, nested prefabs, game objects, and components. If we look at the sphere, we'll see it's, as you know it, it has a mesh filter, renderer, sphere collider. The only difference is that we have runtime converting this game object data into entity representation. And in dots, we make a distinction between the data that the game code operates on and the data that content creators use. And bridging those two worlds 
is the conversion workflow. It converts from an authoring-friendly game object representation to runtime-optimized entities. And this optimized dots data is streamable, it's compact, and it's optimal for performance. And in the preview inspector, you can see that conversion in happening live. So when Martin changes the physics body to be dynamic, you can see the inspector update here, and you can see exactly what these runtime game code components that are actually being used at runtime are being generated from your very simple to easy, un easy to use understand authoring representation up there. Now, to build a game, you need at least a couple of core features. So we built a third-person shooter, and it uses all the brand new DOTS features, animation, physics, rendering, and netcode together. And we made a very small, simple sample project with the purpose of being easy to understand and digest. So Lucas, let's have a play. All right, let's go. <coughs> All right, where are you? Everyone should know that Joe made me promise to lose. <laughs> <laughs> so he wouldn't look silly. <laughs> uh, good takeaway. <laughs> Um, so, what you see here, this is running on our FPS netcode. It is built on top of DOTS, and it makes it easy to create any network game using an FPS netcode architecture. It has everything that you would expect. Client-side prediction, lag compensation, and interpolation are all built in. We're also using the new Unity Animation package. It is high performance, very flexible, and there are no black boxes. Every character in this game uses Runtime IK. As you can see here, the, the feet are perfectly sticking to the, uh, to the Chrome ball. We use Unity Physics for the character controller, sliding along the walls, jumping, and going over the floor. We're using Raycasts from Unity Physics for the shooting, and for rendering, we're using the scriptural render pipelines with a dot space rendering component for optimal performance. So Martin, the only thing I'm just not too sure about in this is the color scheme you picked. Yeah, <clears throat> the baby blue might be an issue. We can try and find something a bit cooler. Uh, let's try something gra grass-like, more green. Try that. I save. And boom, there you have it on your device. I can also try something else, maybe, that didn't work out that beautifully, but like a midnight purple. Do that. All right. Push it. All right, so that's a big deal, because Martin has... Uh. <laughs> oh. oh, the color wasn't that nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a big deal, because Martin has this project open in the editor, but me and Joachim, we are running built players that are running the game. And he's making a change in the editor on the left, but it's affecting the players while they're running the game that don't have to reboot. Yeah. So since I'm generating runtime-ready data on the editor end, there's no reason that I can't push it to any device. Right. So what kind of changes can you make? Um, anything, really. If you look at the, the Chrome Sphere, Joe, then I can, you know, I can make translations. Uh, I can duplicate. Um, you know, make another sphere uh, and go back to, to you know, the static component that I touched on the physics body, make it dynamic, they'll fall down, collide, maybe topple over if we're lucky. There we go. So yeah, um, I can even make changes to shaders. Let's go into my shader graph where, like any good TV chef, I prepared a little effect that we can drop on, save, Boom. Uh, so that's what I really love about this feature, that... It's <laughs> what I really love. I was running on the tablet, Joachim was running on a desktop. 
We could also attach a console and a phone, and they would all attach to the same editing session. And when Martin makes a change, Dots bakes out the, the entity data for each of those devices individually. So that means that he can see the changes on all of those devices without the devices having to restart or the games having to reboot. Yeah, and it is, this is no matter the device. It could be a console or an iPhone or anything, really. So yeah. what does that do to your workflow as an artist? Yeah, as an environmental artist, this means I can build my entire world on the device with direct feedback on actual device performance. It'll be immediately visible to me if I have performance headroom in one space of the level, and I can add more detail there, or if I need to optimize in another part of the level. And instead of looking through complex profiling tools, I can simply hide or delete elements and see the performance impact on the scene. So and I believe this will have an incredible impact on your productivity. And fortunately, all of these features, Unity Animation, FPS Netcode, Live Link, and Conversion Flow will ship as preview packages alongside Unity 2019.3. <laughs> and we're also going to make the full project folder that we just showed you with all source code and assets available very soon. Right, thank you. Thank you.